thank, thanks for the invitation to talk here. So I'll talk about uh, constraint satisfaction problems with uh, global modular constraints and algorithms and hardness results for these problems. This is joint work with uh, Venkat Guruswamy from CMU and Joshua Brackensig from Stanford. So, so we all know uh, that we can solve linear equations mod two pretty efficiently. So this is the lint two problem. So I give you a set of linear equations modulo two and ask you to find a binary X which satisfies all these linear equations. You can do this very efficiently and the algorithm is very well known. It's the Gaussian elimination. You can eliminate the variable. Uh, you can do Gaussian elimination, put it in a diagonal form and then solve it or say that there are no solutions. And in fact, it works for any field. But suppose we add a twist to this. Uh, so I give you a system of linear equations mod two, but I, I, I also give you one extra equation, just one extra equation modulo m, where m is not equal to two. Say m is three or four or five, six, something like that. And uh, so think of m as a constant. And now I ask you to find, a sol ask whether is there a solution that satisfies all the mod two equations and this mod m equation. Uh -huh. Simultaneously. Sorry, there was a question. Okay. So, and I, well, the, everyone this, else is going to ask: uh, Is uh, m doesn't need to be co-prime to two? Uh, let's assume it is co-prime here. Yeah. I mean, we can we can also ask a question with it's co-prime, but uh, let's let's say assume it is m is odd here for uh, for simplicity. Thanks. Yeah. Let's throughout the talk, I'll only talk about odd m. Okay, so, uh, and now Gaussian elimination breaks. We can't use Gaussian elimination to, uh, to solve this problem. More generally, you can ask, uh, you know, I ask, uh, I add a bunch of equations model of possibly different M's, but, and think of, but think of M and K as constants, because if you show, if you, if M and K can grow with N, then it quickly becomes NP hard. So let's think of M and K as constants. Okay, so uh, now the question is, is this problem easier or hard? Okay. So what's your guess? Does anyone want to take a guess? Uh, easy. Hard. Easy. Okay. <laughs> okay. So there are both ways. So as you'll see, the answer is much more interesting. It's, ne it's, it's not easy to say it's easier or hard. So it depends very much on the constant M, which is very interesting. So before that, before we answer this question, let's delve into some philosophical question, um, which is, the following. So, you know, entire theory, a lot of theoretical computer science is about, you know, designing algorithms for problems and designing hard, proving that, you know, some uh, proving hardness results, saying that you can't have efficient algorithms or so. So, and, and, and theory's dream is, you know, you design increasingly better algorithms, you, and then you prove increasingly better hardness results until they meet, at least asymptotically, and then you have the zap, you know, we close the problem when they meet. You know, but uh, there is a, so this is, you know, a dream, you know, when you have matching algorithms and hardness results, uh, but this is very slow and there is a completely different way to achieve this dream, which is uh, the following thing. So what you do is you design an algorithm A and then you show that if I find a hard instance for this algorithm, I can use it as a gadget to prove a tight hardness result. So it, it, so we are indirectly proving that this algorithm is optimal. So this, of course, proves that your algorithm you designed is optimal. So let me just repeat it. So you, you design an algorithm A, and then you prove that if there is a hard distance for this algorithm in, on which this algorithm runs very slow or doesn't do very well, then I can use it to show a hardness proof that no algorithm can do very well on this uh, on, for this problem, okay? So here, the algorithms, uh, the, the proof of optimality or the algorithms and hardness results are very tightly related. Okay, so a classic example of this is a famous result by Raghavendra and other, and many other papers, uh, people who showed that there is a canonical STP, which achieves the best approximation ratio for every constraint satisfaction problem, assuming unique games conjecture. So the way it is done is, you know, you take this uh, canonical STP, and if you find a hard instance for this, like assume there is a hard instance where the approximation ratio, approximation ratio is bad, you can convert this a hard instance into a gadget for a hard UGC hardness reduction. Okay, so that shows that you know this uh, STP should be the optimal one. Okay. So the goal of this work is to show something similar 
for CSPs with uh, global modular constraints. So we don't go all the way, you know, we don't get such tight thing, but we kind of hint at such a, such a possibility. Okay, so in the rest of the talk, I'll talk about, uh, you know, uh, first uh, I'll introduce more formally what the CSPs and global modular constraints are. Then I'll discuss our algorithms and hardness results. Then we'll delve deeper into two such problems, which is the lint mod m which I introduced in the beginning, and another similar problem called hardness. And then we'll end with some open questions. Okay. Okay, so um, let me let me first formally define what CSPs uh, global modular constraints are. So CSPs, I, I guess most of you are familiar here. So a CSP is just a bunch of constraints or clauses. Um, so in the, throughout this talk, I'll only talk about Boolean CSPs. So it's just a collection of clauses, phi one, phi two, and so on, phi r. Each phi i is usually of a specific form. And then we want to, we, and the question is, uh, we want to find a binary X which satisfies all the clauses simultaneously. Okay, so if you give different forms to the constraints, you will get different problems. For example, in two sat, each constraint is, involves just two variables. And the, in lin two, uh, there is a, that each constraint is a linear equation mod two. And then there's this thing called horn sat where each constraint is on the following form. A bunch of clauses, a bunch of variables, if they're all true, it will imply another variable is true. So this horn set is supposed to model inference where like you have a set of statements and then if a bunch of statements are true, then you can, uh, you can say that another statement is true and so on. And then, so you start with a bunch of axioms and you want to infer all the things possible. So horn set has these clauses. You can also set some variables to be zero or one, okay? So it turns out that this two sat, horn set and lin two can be solved in polynomial time. Whereas three sat, as we know, is NP complete. Okay, and in fact, these three problems are somehow, uh, you know, some kind of canonical problems in the sense that any other Boolean CSP, if you can solve it in polynomial time, it can only like you can reduce it to one of these three. So in some sense, these three are some kind of complete problems for polynomial time uh, Boolean CSPs. Okay, so that's why we study only these three because there is some sort of theory behind this that you just need to focus on these three problems. Okay, so now what happens if we add a global modular constraint to this? Uh, then quickly all these problems become, a global uh, cardinality constraint to this, then all these problems become NP complete. So you want to find an X whose Hamming weight is some particular number. Uh, is there such a solution? Then suddenly all these problems become NP complete. So now we ask, uh, what if it, it's not a cardinality constraint, what is it is a modular constraint? So let's say I want to find an odd weight solution or an even weight vector which satisfies this, or maybe a vector whose weight is divisible by three and so on. Uh, more generally, you can, you can write some equation in an abelian group. So, so, this, uh, so then what happens to the complexity of these problems? Three set, of course, remains NP complete, but what happens to the pro complexity of two set mod m, on set mod m, and lint to mod m. So that is something we'll try to answer in this talk. So here is a sneak peek at your results. So as you can see, lint to mod m, let's say, or let's say two set mod m is just always easy for all these constants m. Whereas if you look at lint two, it is easy for, you know, three, four, nine. It's hard for 15. It's again easy for 17, but it's again hard for 21. And similarly for on side, do you, do you see a pattern here? Yes. Yep. More yeah, than one also. prime factor. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, so if it turns out that if M has more than one prime factor, then it suddenly these problems become these problems become hard. But if it's a prime power, these problems remain easy. And let's say M is odd for the case of the Lintu model. Okay. So uh, that's quite interesting, and we'll see why that such you know things happen in. Uh, so what was the motivation for this problem? So there is a paper by uh, Nagel, Sudakov, and Zinkusen where they studied submodular function minimization with such modular constraints. So here you're given a submodular function f and you want to find, um, you want to minimize this function only over, uh, let's say, odd weight vectors or even weight vectors or vectors that satisfy some modular constraint. Okay, so all things where the Hamming weight is A mod M. So SFM mod two is easy. And this was shown by uh, Groschel, Lovash, and Schreiber uh, in, 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 in 81. 
And Dunkel sort of and Colson showed that you can, this is also easy when M is any prime power. Uh, and the algorithm is much simpler, it's, it's quite simple. Uh, and then, but but they asked, like they basically they asked if SFM mod six, why you know they, they didn't have any idea whether they didn't, you know, they made a conjecture, maybe it is easy or maybe it's hard, but like it's not clear what can we say about SFM mod six and why suddenly like six is so special. It, there is no clarity on why six is so special here. Okay, so and the reason they studied this is because of further connection to solve, you know, the following question. Which is a very important question in uh, in in linear programming. Which is, can we solve integer linear programs where all the minors are bounded by some fixed constant delta? So if delta is one, these are called unimodular ILPs, and we can of course solve them. And if delta is two, then these are called bimodular ILPs. And this was recently shown that we can solve such problems also efficiently in polynomial time. So for example, if it's bimodular, all the uh, linear programming solutions are half integral, but but it's not clear how we can find an optimal integral solution, but they show that you can. And this problem is open for delta Q, as far as I know. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, yeah. What does it mean that a minor is bounded by delta? Uh, it's just, a minor is just a determinant of a submatrix, right? So minor, so if you calculate it, it's an integer program, so you'll get some integer. And this integer has to be between minus two and two. Okay. Or minus delta and delta. Okay, any other questions so far? Okay, so so let's uh, so let me get to what what we were able to prove and what we were not able to prove. So, so these are our results. What we show is that two set mod M is always easy. Okay, so if you add a model constant two sets, it's always easy. Lin two mod M, let's say M, assume M is odd, then if M is a prime power, it is easy. So it's easy in real time. But if M has more than one prime factor, it is hard. And the same is true for onset mod M. And SFM mod M, which is the problem that, you know, we started this work really, it's easy, uh, is showed by this Nagel sort of, uh, Nagel et al. paper, but we couldn't, we, we don't know if it is hard, but we, I, I suspect that it is hard. And, and they, as we see, okay, not in this talk, but there is a very close connection between SFM mod M and onset mod M. Turns out the hard instances are exactly similar, and there is lots of connections. But in this talk, I won't go into this. But SFM modem is very morally very close to Hansat modem. Okay, so you know, I let so this is a more detailed picture of what's happening. So, uh, so all the hardness results are assuming ETH. So ETH is the following uh, conjecture or the hypothesis that uh, you can't. If you have a three sad problem with n classes, you can't solve it in two to the little o n time. Okay, so you actually need exponential time to solve three sad. So that so this is our assumption, and the hardness results assume this assumption. And two sad mod m requires n to the m time, and we have a matching nearly matching hardness result. Oh, the hardness results are due to Arvind and Goswami. For lin two mod m and horn sad mod m. Uh, so when m is a prime power, we have an algorithm which runs in n to the m time but we don't, and the matching harness result, but M has uh, multiple prime factors, we don't have any kind of non-trivial algorithms. But what we can show is that you can't run in polynomial time. It has to run in exponential, at least quasi-poly time uh, here. And, and I think we can improve this quite a bit here. Uh, so we'll see why. And then the question is completely open for SFM mod M. What we know is that M is a prime power, we can solve it, but I don't know any complex term. Okay, so any questions? Okay. So let's uh, just study lin to mod M. So uh, if you, so uh, yeah, so, so let me just remind you what lin to mod M is. So we have a system of linear equations modulo two and one extra equation modulo m, and we want to uh, and we want to find a solution. Like, for, we want to know whether there's a solution, and m is odd in this case. Okay, so there is a very simple algorithm. So the algorithm that we have, or which works for n m is a, m is a prime power, is very simple. It's like simplest algorithm you can think of. So the set of solutions to the linear equations mod two forms a subspace of f two to the n, right? 
So just find this affine subspace, find some basis for this. And now, now our question is, is there an X in the subspace whose Hamming weight is A mod M? This is what we want to solve. So our algorithm is very simple. Just sample random points from V and test if one of them works. And what we show is that if there is a solution, there should be sufficiently many if an M is a prime power. And if there is no solution, then, you know, then we are good. Okay, so just sampling randomly from V, if we will find a solution, if there is one. So, so for this to work, what we need to show is that either there doesn't, there is no solution in V, or there has to be a large fraction of solutions. You can't have like a very sparse number of solutions in a subspace. Uh, so, uh, so, so what are hard instances for our algorithm? So hard instances for our algorithm are large subspaces which have very few solutions. And let's say just one solution, let's say. So if you, if you have a large subspace with exactly one vector X, such that uh, the Hamming weight of X is A mod M, then our algorithm fails spectacularly on such a subspace. Because if you just um, sample random points, there is no way you will find this single solution. Okay, so these are, are my hard instances. And so it turns out that this hard instance is related to sparsity of R mod M over, as a polynomial. So, so let me just define what this, or what, what do I mean by that? So we say that a polynomial represents R mod M over plus one minus one basis if it, is, if it has the following property. So think of this as a Boolean cube. So if it should take zero mod M at one and everywhere else it should take non-zero mod M values. So R function, it should take, think of, so plus one minus one, so minus one, you should think of it as, um, as, as true and one, you should take it as false. So then R will, will be zero when everything is one. So P of one should be zero mod M. Everywhere else, it should be non-zero mod M, okay? So we say that if, if you have such a polynomial and we say that it represents R mod M, okay? So it's just a polynomial which only vanishes modulo M at the point all once. Everywhere else it's non-zero mod M. And let's call SM of T the minimum sparsity of such a polynomial and delta the minimum degree of such a polynomial. So it turns out that hard instances are related to uh, polynomials which are very sparse. And sorry, this so, sorry, can I ask you a question? What is the sparsity yeah. of a polynomial? It's the number of monomials. in the Number polynomial. of monomials, okay. Yeah. Okay, so, and this sparsity measure, the, this complexity measure, which is the sparsity of polynomials, which represents R mod M or plus one minus one basis, turns out it's very closely related to locally decodable codes. So if you have very sparse polynomial, which represents R or plus one minus one basis, you can use it to construct good matching vector families from which you can get really good locally decodable codes. So this is a very interesting uh, measure of a polynomial. So like, are there, very interesting question, because it also has connections to other uh, in, uh, uh, like locally decodable codes. Okay, so if you do have sparse polynomials, then you get really good locally decodable codes. And in fact, our hard instances are in fact exactly sparse representations of R. So, uh, so we'll see a proof shortly. So what we will show is that if you have a hard instance for, a, or lin for our algorithm, which is a large subspace with just exactly one solution, which is uh, with one solution to our modular constraint, then you can convert it into a sparse polynomial, which represents R mod M. Oh, really? Okay. So why is this true? So can a question? Yeah. Um, so now you've uh, changed the problem to just finding a subspace of F2 to the M with this one or very few uh, solutions to the mod M equation. Yeah, let's assume one solution. One solution. So, but the kind of subspaces that you're dealing with, it's completely generic. It's not that you only have subspaces that are determined by sparse constraints or something. Like no, that. it can be completely generic, right? Because I said my modulo two constraints are any arbitrary. Anything. Model. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. But in fact, I mean, you can write any subspace as I think also sparse linear equations by introducing extra variables. <laughs> Okay, so, uh, right. So what this means is that if you're able to show that uh, there are no sparse polynomials, then we'll have a good algorithm, 
right? By proving a lower bound on sparsity, it's like by showing a lower bound on sparsity, we will get a good upper bound, which is an algorithm. Okay, so somehow we will need to relate the largeness of V to the sparsity. So let's see how it works. So let's assume, so re recall that hard instances are large subspaces or affine subspaces with exactly one solution. And we want to convert such a thing into a sparse representation. So the other direction is also true, but I'll only show one direction here, which is that hard sub uh, instances imply, uh, or large subspaces imply sparse representation. So let's, let's say V is a d-dimensional linear subspace of F2 to the N, such that uh, for every non-zero X, I have, more, uh, the Hamming weight of X is non-zero mod M. So zero is the only solution to this equation. The Hamming weight of X is zero mod M. So there is no other vector in this in my subspace whose Hamming weight is divisible by M, except the zero vector. Okay, from this, I, need, I want to show that there is a sparse polynomial which represents R mod M on D variables with sparsity N, okay? So if D is large, it means I have a very sparse polynomial, uh, which, right? If D is large, I have a sparse polynomial or many variables. So how does this work? So let's see, the proof is very simple. It's not very hard. So, um, so for, let's, say, uh, let's say the columns of U form, is, U is an N by D matrix, whose columns form the basis for my vector space V, for my subspace V. And let's say U1 to UN are the rows of U. Okay, so the columns form the subspace, uh, form a basis for the subspace, which is an N by D matrix, and U1 to UN are the rows of it. So I can write V as U times Y, where Y is uh, ranges over F2 to the D. Okay, so that's my subspace, which is the inner, per so the first coordinate is the inner product of U1 and Y, second uh, coordinate is U2 and Y, and so on. So, so therefore my subspace has the following property because the subspace, the only vector which is zero mod M is zero. I have the following uh, conclusion. The Hamming weight of U, U times Y is zero mod M if and only if Y is zero, okay? So I want to convert this into a polynomial, which is sparse. So what I'll do is I'll define a polynomial P of Z1 to ZD as follows, it's sum over i ranging from one to n, half of one minus z to the ui. Okay, so z to the ui is like, I'm raising the first variable to the first coordinate of u, and the second variable to the second coordinate of ui, and so on. So this is like, when I raise a vector to a vector, it is like coordinate wise raising. Okay, any questions over? So why is this a good polynomial? So now if I plug in minus one to the y1 to minus one to the yd into this, what I will have is a summation i one minus. So if I substitute minus one to the y for z, I'll get minus one to the inner product of u and y. And this quantity one minus this is exactly the same as u i d u i times y, because this is zero one, right? Uh, so this is just the Hamming weight. So basically, p at minus one to the y is just the Hamming weight of u times y modulo two. Everything here is mod. So what this means is, but, uh, but I know that UY is zero mod M if and only if Y is zero, which means that P will only take the zero mod M value when, when I give it all one's vector. Everywhere else, it will take non-zero mod M. And the sparsity of P is exactly N plus one because it has N monomials corresponding to the rows of this. Okay, any questions? So this P has the following property at all once, it takes zero mod M, everywhere else it's non-zero mod M and it has exactly N plus one monomials. So can I just uh, slow you down or uh, somehow yeah. can you explain like what is going on here or I mean? So, uh, so basically, hmm, what is going on here? <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's just a, a four line thing, but somehow uh, I find it a hard, hard to understand. Right. Uh, what, I, I don't see what's the intuition for it, but basically this polynomial, which, um, I don't really have a good 
way to explain it intuitively, except that. <laughs> okay. Maybe I let me just go over it again. So just take the so we formed we just found a basis for this uh, vector space, this subspace V, and then the U's are the U one to U n are the rows of this matrix, right? So that my I am writing my subspace as U times Y, where Y ranges over D all D dimensional vectors, right? And then what I know is that this u times y is zero mod m if and only if y is zero. Okay, and the main thing is to write u the Hamming weight of u times y as a polynomial in in y or minus one to the y. Right, and it turns out that it is a polynomial and it's sparse. The sparsity is exactly the number of uh, rows here in u. So it's just a small simple transformation to write u times y the Hamming weight of u times y as a polynomial. Okay. Maybe you want to do it uh, written in reverse. You can define this polynomial for any u. Yeah. Right? Any subspace defines a polynomial. Right. The property of this polynomial is that when you evaluate it uh, on uh, this vector, it can, tells you what's the Hamming weight. Hamming weight, exactly. Yeah. So this is true for any subspace, but just the fact that our subspace is special, it only has one vector. Yeah, but that's eventually, that's a final thing. I mean, maybe yeah, that's a final thing. this at the end, you know, it's a general construction. Yeah. And if your subspace happens to have only one such, uh, right? In general, you have a polynomial which represents some function. But if your subspace happens to have only, uh, you know, zero mod M, one, only the zero solution is, uh, uh, zero mod m, then it will represent the all function. Yeah. Okay. So, so that is the so that is the connection, and the other way also works. I'm not going over it. So, um, yeah. So what we are showing is that hard instances for our algorithm, this very simple algorithm where we sample at random, are exactly this large subspaces with very with just one solution or very few solutions, and somehow that is very closely related to sparsity of R mod M or plus one minus one basis. So let's have an, uh, so now the, from this we can quickly get, you know, uh, because we can study the sparsity in using just tools from algebra. Sorry. Just, yeah. a short, uh, just a short question. So uh, what do you do when uh, you have many solutions? Just uh, so, I mean, many, but still few, many, but so, still few. So let's say you have many, but still few. What you can do is you can, Take a take take one solution and find a random subspace passing through that. It most likely will not have it intersect any other thing. So you can still get a large subspace with just exactly one solution. Okay. Uh, so when m is a prime power, you can show that the sparsity should be exponentially large, and this follows very easily from Fermat's little theorem. Okay, so because if it represents R, if you raise it to the power m minus one, it should exactly represent R, and then the, uh, and then or, or modular primes or prime powers, you can show that if it exactly represents R, you need to have all two to the monomials. So, so the, what this implies is that there are no sparse representations modular prime powers. So therefore, there are no hard instances for algorithm, which means our algorithm runs in polynomial time, randomized polynomial time. Okay, uh, but if M has many distinct prime factors, so there is this really famous result by Barrington, Bagel, and Rudish, who showed that the degree of R mod M, so if you, you can represent, there is a low degree polynomial which represents R mod M, and the degree is uh, D to the one over R. So if you have two prime factors, two distinct prime factors, then you only need square root D degree, which means the sparsity is exponential in square root D. So, and this implies that there are non-trivial sparse representations of R, which means there are non-trivial hard instances for our algorithm. So our algorithm cannot run in polynomial time when M has R distinct prime factors. But this just shows that our algorithm cannot run, but maybe there is some other algorithm which can run in polynomial time. So how do we rule, out, rule that out? So we'll give a hardness proof now. So remember our uh, dream before, which is that you want to use a hard instance as a gadget to prove a tight hardness result, okay? Which proves the optimality of our algorithm. So here we showed that the hard instances are sparse polynomials of R mod M over this plus one minus one basis. But what will cheat somewhat, and we, we will not use them directly as, as a hardness gadget, but we'll show that 
a low degree polynomial of R can be used as a hardness gadget. Okay, so this is an imperfect, uh, you know, dream because you know if you have a low degree implies sparsity, but sparsity does not mean you have a low degree. So you cannot directly use the hard instance as a hardness gadget. We're using some extra property which is low degree here. Okay. So let's. Uh, so any questions? So let's see how we can use such a thing. So I want to reduce 3SAT to a lin2 modem instance. Okay. So let's start with the 3SAT formula. So let's say this gamma is a 3SAT formula. There are clauses phi1, phi2, and so on, phi n. So let's assume that uh, everywhere the variables are plus one, minus one, and the phi's also return plus one, minus one values. Okay, think of them as degree three polynomials, which take plus one, minus one values and up spit out plus one, minus one, where true is one and false is minus one. Okay. Uh, drop it. Uh, yeah. This reduction will be uh, sub exponential or something. Uh, this will be polynomial in the size of the lint2 modem instance that we'll create. Okay, so the hardness was uh, only quasi polynomial, no? Right, that's because we'll create a really huge lint2 modem instance. Okay, so it will be. So yeah, it, it will be, yeah, it will be, it will be sub x, yeah, I guess, yeah. or quasi, something okay. like that, yeah something bad but at least it will be non-trivial it won't be it won't create an exponential size into my instance it'll create a much it's a smaller instance and what is our hardness gadget our hardness gadget is a low degree polynomial which represents all right so we have a low degree polynomial such that uh, this polynomial p takes uh, zero at all one's vector and everywhere else it takes non-zero modem Okay, so I want to use this as a hardness gadget. So the main observation is very simple. So gamma is satisfiable if and only if there is an X such that if I plug in these phi's into P, I should get zero modem. Right. Let, I'll give you a moment to just uh, read and absorb this because that is the crux of the proof, really. So it's, and it's a very simple statement. So I'm saying that, so, Satisfying the three-set formula is like finding an X where all the fees are one. And I can test if all the fees are one by plugging them into P and checking whether the answer is zero modem or not. Because P only takes zero modem at all once. Right? So, so therefore gamma is satisfiable if and only if there is an X in plus one minus one to the N such that Q, which is just take P and plug in this phi one to phi x as degree three polynomials into P, that should give you zero model. Okay, is this clear? Yeah. Okay, so now we want to convert this question. So I have a polynomial and I want to, I'm asking, is this polynomial zero mod m at some point? Now I want to convert this problem into a lintu mod m instance. How do I convert it? So this polynomial Q, will have many monomials. So for each monomial, I'll create a variable y and call it y. Let's say I have a monomial uh, of X, uh, product of xi, i in s. I'll create a variable y sub s. And intuitively what you should think is this product, this monomial should be equal to minus one to the y s. So this is what, you know, this is my mapping of what this y s should mean, okay? And then, uh, this uh, this constraint that q of x is zero mod m, I can convert it into a linear equation mod m in bias variables because so this q x mod m is summation a s times uh, this product of i in s x i zero equal to zero mod m. But intuitively, uh, this thing this product of x i this monomial should be minus one to the y s, and minus one to the y s is same as one minus two times y s because y s is zero one. Okay, so I can convert this into a linear equation. Uh, in the bias variables modular m, okay? And the final thing, which is the most important thing, is I should somehow enforce some consistency checks among the monomials. Because if I have x1, x2, and I multiply with x2, x3, I should get back the answer for x1, x3. Because this, these are plus one, minus one random variables, x2 squared is one. So this is, uh, this is a consistency check that I should enforce among my y variables, right? So what this means is that the corresponding y variable y12 plus y23 should be equal to y13 mod 2. And I can enforce all such consistency checks among the monomials as linear equations mod 2 in the y variables. 
Okay, this is clear. So this is, uh, I'll use some time to think about it. So the monomials become variables per my link to modem instance. This Q of X equal to zero mod M becomes a linear equation mod M in the Y variables. And the consistency check among the monomials should, can be implemented using linear equations model. Okay. Good, so, so now we created a link to mod M instance. And uh, so, and our original, so there exists such an X uh, such that Q of X is zero mod M if and only if my lint two mod M instance is satisfied. And, and the degree of Q is at most three times Delta, which means that sparsity is like N to the three Delta, let's say, uh, which means that, and the number of variables in my lint two mod M instance, mod M instance is related to the sparsity of Q. So, so therefore, if I have a three sat clause uh, with n clauses, I'll get a lintu mod m instance with n to the three times delta variables. Okay, okay. can I can I stop yeah. you for a minute? Yeah. Okay. So it's so it's very nice. So you basically uh, these y's encode XORs of the x's. Yeah. Or not XORs. I don't know products if it's plus yeah, minus right. one. Yeah, but like, yeah, it's, yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of like XOR. Yeah. If we're in zero one, these are XORs of yeah, the X's. Yeah. And you put some equations to make sure that the Y's indeed encode that. Yeah. And you also have an equation mod M over the Y's. Right. Basically, what you need are, are just the Y's that participate in your representation of the OR right. a, mon a polynomial. Yeah. So, Really, if you had some other representation that's sparse, you would need some other bunch of y's. Yeah. Maybe not those with size at most delta, but something else. Yeah. And you would maybe need some more y's just to make sure you have the consistency. Mm -hmm. And so you don't really need the fact that the degree is at most delta. So the problem is the following. If, so we know that the p has degree delta but I'm plugging in some degree three polynomials into it. So even if P is sparse, when I plug in the fees, it might become non-sparse. I see. So you're so the only P way I can sparse. Con yeah. Oh, and this is how you're controlling the sparsity. So P, yeah. uh, I see, composed with phi, will only have degree three delta, which is also of the right. same kind of sparsity. Whereas if it was some other polynomial, you might suddenly blow up the, the, sparsity, the sparsity when you plug yeah, in. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, all right, thanks. So that's why we need a degree delta. So if we couldn't, so if we started with the sparse polynomial as our gadget, then it would have been perfect. We had a complete perfect optimality of our algorithm. But uh, we, the reason we cannot do it is because plugging in the fees might blow up sparsity unless we control the degree. Maybe there is a better reduction. I don't know. Okay, so but basically we showed that uh, we so we can convert a three set with n clauses into a lint to mod m instance with n to the three delta variables. Delta is a degree of this or polynomial. Okay, so that will give us the hardness result that we want. And uh, basically, and the fact that we have low degree polynomials for or mod m will give us the hardness result, as we said. Okay, so. So this is the summary of the modem. So we have hard instances for algorithm. We showed that these are relate, these are same as sparse representations of R mod M, but uh, we use low degree representations of R mod M to, as a hardness gadget for ETH hardness reduction. So this is a missing arrow. Low degree implies sparsity, but you know, the other way doesn't work. So if we had the missing arrow, then this would have been a perfect circle. Okay, so how do we fix this? Either we have to change the algorithm so that the hard instances are not sparse polynomials, but low degree polynomials, or the other way, use sparse polynomials somehow as a hardness gadget, or we may need to change both, find some other complex dimension. But uh, sorry for interrupting again. Yeah. Is this just for aesthetic reason, or is there something more going on in this missing arrow? I mean, I mean, Why do you so really want this missing arrow? If we have the missing arrow, then it means that we have the optimal algorithm for this problem. 
like we cannot do anything assuming eth the best algorithm is to sample random points from v whereas what other option without now we have the missing arrow so what other option is now still viable that you haven't ruled out it's possible that maybe there are better algorithms than just sampling random points they're still not going to be polynomial time but they might be better than this algorithm yeah better than this algorithm. okay there can be polynomial time uh, well, no, no. We, we rule at least for yeah for m is not a prime oh, power we rule that out because yeah. we have this. assuming eth yes <laughs> yeah, assuming eth yeah. yes okay so because i'm running out of time i'll not say much about the horn set uh, so here the it turns out we have an algorithm again and the algorithm for this algorithm the hard instances are related to this complexity measure of uh, representing nan modem so it's not sparsity it's not degree it's a new complexity measure, which is the fault, which I'll describe now. So what is representing, say, we say that a polynomial represents NAND, which is the uh, negation of AND mod M. If it takes, and here we are over zero one basis, not minus one, one. It's important that we change the basis. So it is zero one basis, and it represents NAND if it is zero at all ones, zero mod M at all ones vector, everywhere else it's non-zero mod M. Okay, so this is the representation of NAND mod M. Okay, so the complexity measure of a polynomial that we are interested in is something we call the covering number. So what is this covering number? So the covering number of a polynomial is, uh, so if the polynomial has monomials, which are indexed by the subsets S1, S2, and so on, Sn. Suppose it has N monomials, and each monomial is a multilinear polynomial. Uh, so each monomial is given by a subset, and these are my subsets, S1 to Sn, which corresponds to the monomials, N monomials. Then the covering number is the min set cover of this sets. Okay, so it is the smallest collection of monomials which includes every variable. Okay, so is that clear? So I want to find the smallest number of monomials which such that they cover all the variables. So that is the covering number of this polynomial. And it's important, and uh, throughout this n will be the number of monomials in my polynomial, not the number of variables. Okay, so we want to understand the covering number as a function of n, which is the number of monomials. So CM of n is the minimum covering number of a polynomial which has n monomials and represents NAND mod m over some over zero one basis. Okay, so there is no uh, so just uh, um, observe that we don't have anything about the number of variables here. So it it can be any number of variables, but it should represent NAND, which is that. At all ones, it should be zero. Everywhere else, it should be not zero. So that's the covering number. So, and it turns out that hard instances for our algorithm are exactly polynomials for NAND with high covering number. So, which means, so we have an algorithm. Which, so we have the following theorem: Horn sat mod M and also SFM mod M, which is the submodular function in equation, can be solved in n to the CM of n time. So if the covering number of, uh, of is small, which then which means that we have uh, non-trivial algorithms for this problem. But if the covering number is large, like n, which is a trivial thing, then you don't have any non-trivial. And we can show that when m is a prime power, the covering number is a constant. So you only need a constant number of monomials to cover all the things, and the co the constant is m minus one. So which means that when m is a prime prime power, we have n to the m minus one time algorithms for this problem. But when M has many distinct prime factors, we can show that the covering number has to grow log, like polynomial in log of N, which means that our algorithm will run in, needs to run at least in quasi-poly time. Okay, but that's not a hardness result, but we can show a hardness result also here. So what this shows is that there are hard instances for algorithm, where our algorithm needs to run at least quasi-poly time when M is uh, not a prime power. And we conjecture that this CM of N should be N to the little one, which means that these problems can always be solved in two to the N to the little one time. Uh, uh, unfortunately, we don't have a proof of this conjecture of this right C conjecture, I guess. <laughs> so, uh, and we don't even know, in fact, if it is even little one. So why did we make such a strong conjecture if we don't even know that it's little N? Uh, so what we show is the following. We have some evidence towards this conjecture. 
what we show is that the fractional covering number, so this is a different complexity measure. So what, so the covering number is a set cover, but if you relax it and you say, uh, you, if you define the fractional covering number, that we show it to be n to the little one. So what that implies is that the covering number itself is log d times n to the little one, where d is the number of variables. But what we want is a bound which is independent of d. And that we could not get uh, such a bound. Uh, but I think I, we believe that there should be such a bound. In fact, the covering number has to be n to the little one, independent of the number of variables. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay. So let me get into. So I won't go into too many details, but I'll show you how we show that the fractional covering number is so small. It's an interesting proof. Uh, so, so we want to show that the fractional covering number is small. So the main idea is we want to reduce it to a degree lower bound. So there is a famous lower bound by Barrington and Targos uh, who showed that the, to represent the NAND or 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 any polynomial or NAND or 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 AND mod M, you need to have degree which is at least log D to the one over R minus one, uh, if M has R prime factors, okay? So you can't have constant degree, that's all. Basically it has to grow with number of variables a little bit. So we want to reduce it this covering number to the degree lower bound. Okay, then this is the best lower bound we have on the, on, the, on the degree. Whereas the best upper bound is like D to the one over R. Okay, so there is still a lot of gap, but let's assume this is the best lower bound we have. So suppose P is a polynomial which represents NAND uh, or mod M or zero one basis and let S1 or SN be its monomials. Okay, so, and let's say C is a fractional set cover for this set, a set system S1 to Sn. So the fractional set cover can be written as an LP. So you have a weight for each, each set such that each element is covered by at least one weight and you want to minimize the total weight of the sets. So by LP duality, I can find, this is equal to uh, the dual LP, which is a fractional packing LP, where I have weights on each variable such that on each monomial, the weight is sum to at most one. And I need to, I want to maximize the total weight on the variables. Okay, and these are equal. So what is this saying? This is kind of like you want to select as many variables as possible without choosing too many in any monomial. Okay, so that's what it tells you. It, and it says that if C is large or C, you can find roughly C such variables such that you don't choose too many in each monomial. So, but this is the fractional version to do and to get an integral weight, integral uh, n log of this, we do some randomized rounding. So we do a random random restriction where you set each variable to one with probability one minus b u or square root c, and you keep it alive with probability b u or square root c. So we use the LP to do the random restriction. We don't do it uniform and independently, but each variable is set based on the values of the optimal values of this LP. Okay, so what this means is that when you restrict your polynomial to this random restriction, it again represents NAND, but over a smaller number of variables. But because a summation BU is like C, we should, and we are, we are keeping alive BU, roughly summation BU or square root C variables, we will still have square root C remaining variables. And the degree you can show because uh, summation BU on each monomial is at most one, by a Chernoff bound, you can show that, and union bound over all monomials, you can show that the degree of the restriction will be at most log n over log c with high probability. So now we have a polynomial which represents NAND. It has lots of variables, but it has small degree. So, and then we, so we can use the lower bound of barrington tardos to get the lower bound on C, or an upper bound on C, that it should be n to the little one. Okay. Uh, any questions about this? Okay, so, uh, so yeah, so as we said, so here the, uh, we've seen that the hard instances are polynomials with high covering number, but again, we don't have a perfect, uh, you know, we can't use them directly as hardness instances, we can, but we can use low degree polynomials, again, as, hard, to, as hardness gadgets to, create to prove ETH hardness. So again, here it's not exact, 
uh, and low degree implies high covering number, but not the other way. Okay, so what we so if you have a degree D, so this is the hardness result. If you have a degree delta polynomial which represents NAND, then you can convert three set with D clauses into a horn set with D to, D to the delta variables. Um, and the fact that there are polynomials with low degree implies that horn set with if M has multiple factors, you need at least quasi polytime. Okay, so this is the summary. We again have hard instances are high covering number. The hardness gadgets are low degree, and again, this is the missing arrow. Like it's not exactly the same. One implies the other. Okay, so let me end with some open questions. So as we've seen, the lint to mod M question is 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 a very intimately connected to the sparsity of representing R mod M or plus one minus one basis, right? And so far, we don't even know if you need super linear sparsity. So this is open where we can show un using conditionally that it has to be super linear, like based on uh, some editor combinatrix conjectures, we can show it has to grow super linearly, but unconditionally, we don't know any super linear lower bound here. And if we can show a super linear lower bound, it leads to sub exponential algorithms for this problem. And, and this sparsity measure is also very interesting because it is connected to locally decodable codes. So if you do find very sparse polynomials, it implies really good locally decodable codes. And in the other uh, question for Hornsat, we still open if we can solve it sub exponential time. And if we show that the covering number is n to the little of one, then we can in fact solve it. And we give some good evidence towards this, that by showing that the fractional covering number is small, but we still don't know if the actual covering number is small. So if we show that the actual covering number is n to the little of one, it shows that these problems can be solved in n to the exponential n to the little of one. So, and is SFM mod m hard when m equals six? We still don't know this. So I think it should be hard, but I, I don't know. And, and similarly, is something happen to ILPs, the integer linear programs with bounded determinants? Does something strange happen at six? That doesn't happen for two, three, and four. We don't know. Okay, so let me also do some uh, daydreaming here, which is what happens if we turn our results the other way around to disprove ETH? Can we do that? So like what we show is that, you know, if, if ETH is true, then, you know, maybe the best algorithm is just sampling random points. But maybe if you find better algorithms that does show that disproves ETH. Um, so polynomials mod composites are surprisingly powerful. We don't completely understand them. And it is not implausible that we can break ETH using these surprising objects, right? The fact that we have this low degree polynomials model of composites, maybe such kind of algebraic magic is what you need in our algorithms to break ETH. So I'll leave you with that. And, uh, if, and also it's quite interesting to find more instances of this paradigm where you, know, you, you use a hard instance in that as a gadget directly for the hardness proof. Thank you and stay safe. Okay, thank you very much.